Well, I appreciate the invitation, and uh, this is a, a, obviously a controversial question, and I'd say that my own views have uh, been evolving over time. I suspect that many of you may uh, feel the same way, and that in that pretty even split is, uh, you know, the thoughts that uh, there's some arguments that could be made either way. So uh, we'll talk about some of those, and I'll be speaking from the standpoint that uh, for patients with a deletion, uh, with an Exxon 19 deletion, uh, a fatinib is uh, the go-to choice. So I, I just wanted to uh, put this in uh, the context of uh, an actual patient who I have just recently seen, a 69-year-old retired Filipino never-smoking man with a persistent dry cough for up to a year who has minimal uh, uh, past medical history, just some hyperglycemia, and in May noted an increase in and, and some new supraclavicular lymphadenopathy that led him to call his primary care physician. Uh, that led to a CT of the neck, chest, abdomen, and pelvis being done in short order with a, obviously a significant concern for likely cancer, and that showed very extensive adenopathy, not just in the left supraclavicular region but also a, le a right hilar mass, mediastinal adenopathy that was quite extensive, and spinal and some iliac bone lesions, all consistent with metastatic disease. He was referred to an ENT for a biopsy of the left supraclavicular adenopathy as very accessible, and that showed poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma with acinar features. And uh, I had gotten a heads up that he was coming my way and requested that the pathology department uh, test for uh, EGFR uh, in short order. And the, uh, the, he had a PET scan done that uh, showed metastatic disease as you'd expect. A brain MRI was negative for intracranial metastatic disease and he had a good performance status with uh, no limitation in his activities of daily living. Couldn't really encompass all of his disease in just one or two frames, but that's one sample. and. I, we can go over, I guess, this so uh, a little different variation on the question than what was uh, asked previously. So you have this gentleman with a performance status of one, uh, no prohibitive uh, past medical history or brain metastases. What would you recommend first line, and not just a fatinib or a lotinib, but now gefitinib, which at the time I submitted this was not available, now is available. Uh, EGFR TKI therapy with bevacizumab or a platinum doublet with bevacizumab, with or without bevacizumab. Okay, so fairly even split between a fatinib and erlotinib and uh, TKI with bev as a minority opinion. At this point, gefitinib not yet uh, having the, the uh, role that uh, it would if we were asking this question in Asia where it never left. Can you hold on? Okay. Oh, and uh, this is, I, I think we can skip this one because it's essentially the exact same question that was asked before. So I'm going to turn to discussion of a fatinib. And what we have is prior to the last couple of years, several trials from 2010 through 2012 with uh, gefitinib and with erlotinib compared with various doublets in uh, prospectively defined EGFR mutation positive populations that all have showed a PFS benefit that's quite compelling, hazard ratios around 0.5 or so, and uh, strong differences, uh, striking improvements in response rate compared with standard chemotherapy, but no differences in overall uh, survival. And we could uh, ascribe that to crossover and you know, basically everyone getting the same treatment over time uh, or various other things. So what we uh, then had was two afatinib-based trials with the same real design as, as the other ones with gefitinib and or lotinib that were done uh, in Asia or Europe or some in the U.S. So LuxLung 3 is a, a, an entire global study of a fatinib with cisplatin and pemetrexid uh, for EGFR mutation positive patients. And LuxLung 6 is an Asian uh, trial 
Both of these were two-to-one randomizations of afatinib versus chemotherapy, and in the Asian study, cisplatin and gemcitabine was the uh, comparator arm. Progression-free survival was the primary endpoint, but overall survival was a secondary endpoint. And the initial analyses of these studies really just showed the same things that we've come to expect with uh, gefitinib and erlotinib, a very compelling uh, improvement in progression-free survival and response rate. The more provocative findings were uh, overall survival difference. And I had actually uh, reviewed the initial presentation by Dr. James Yang and colleagues at ASCO in 2014, where they showed a pooled analysis. And I think that that pooled analysis of the two trials really may have confused the issue because it, you might conclude that it was a product of just this much larger population being pooled than was seen in any individual smaller study as being the real reason that there was a survival benefit seen. But in fact, when you look at the two trials separately, they each independently show a survival difference in favor of a fatnib versus chemotherapy, but only in the patients with an exon 19 deletion. And so I would say, yes, it is unique that we are seeing uh, an overall survival difference seen when it was not present in any of these other studies. But what I would also consider compelling, and, and really to me, what has led to some evolution in my own thinking over the last year or so, is the ultimate publication in Lancet Oncology showing the magnitude of difference here of over 12 months. Uh, it's hard enough to see overall survival differences at all. But when you see an overall survival difference of more than a year, it's, it's unusual uh, because we do have, especially these patients, getting treatment after treatment, which should lead to regression toward the mean, and that wasn't seen. Now, I think you could also appropriately ask, well, how unique is this really? Uh, is a fatnib just the same drug as the others, or is there any meaningful difference in the outcomes compared to gefitinib and erlotinib? And when you look at, and this is from uh, Chi Lee uh, uh, in Australia looking at a meta-analysis of various trials uh, with, with other EGFR TKIs at the top, you see that there is no difference uh, in either exon 19 or exon 21 in overall survival for these various trials. So here you could see a slight trend, but nothing remotely statistically significant for these other drugs with erlotinib and gefitinib for exon 19 and a slight trend in the other direction uh, in uh, disfavoring uh, initial treatment with uh, an overall survival for uh, these other drugs. But when we look at the results in, in the patients with, uh, who received a fatnib in these other studies and where they would line up, you can see they're real outliers here, that when you look at uh, Exxon 19 patients, these differences are really outside of the range of what we've seen in the other studies. Uh, certainly, it does not say that there's anything uh, way more compelling about a fatnib in the Exxon 21 patients, but in Exxon 19, this may be a unique effect. It, it requires some further testing, but I would say that uh, the at least retrospective data we have suggests that this is not necessarily literally in line with the exact results we've seen with all of these other trials that preceded it. I'd also say that while we can just wash away the idea that, well, patients crossed over and that's the difference, and, uh, or there was less crossover in the afatinib trials, particularly Lux Lung 6, uh, there were big differences in the rate of crossover in the afatinib trials, and, and particularly based on uh, where they were enrolled from. If they were in a place where uh, coverage was poor, the rate of getting crossover to an EGFR TKI after chemotherapy was really quite disappointing at 52%, which I think is uh, a very sobering thought about global management of cancer when you know someone has an EGFR mutation uh, 
and nearly half the time they fail to get the drug ever. But I think the most important thing to look at is Japan, where you had 100% of patients crossing over, 100%. And in that group of patients, you had every bit of the survival benefit with a fatinib relative to chemotherapy that was seen anywhere else. I mean, here you have, just with the both common mutations pooled, the hazard ratio is below 0.6. When you only look at deletion 19, which is really the question we're asking here, the hazard ratio is 0.34. These were all patients who crossed over to get usually a second line EGFR TKI. So this really suggests to me that we can't wave away the idea that, oh, it's a lack of crossover that is uh, responsible for the problem. These patients all crossed over and they showed every bit of the survival benefit that the total trial showed. Another argument that we might make is that a fatinib is c categorically more toxic. And I think that is certainly a concern, but one that I think we can look at some directly comparative data and and not feel as comfortable making that sweeping generalization about. Here's Lux Lung 8, and this is a direct comparison of erlotinib and afatinib in a completely different population, which is advanced squamous lung cancer. These were almost exclusively EGFR wild type patients. And so the, what the trial showed was an improvement in efficacy for afatinib over erlotinib that I would say is relevant for talking about squamous lung cancer, but not extrapolating to uh, EGFR wild type, uh, EGFR mutation positive patients, but we can potentially look at these comparative results for toxicity, and what was striking to me was the lack of much difference in toxicity between the two. When you look at the actual numbers, a, a few more drug-related AEs with a fatinib but when you look at serious AEs, it's exactly the same between a fatinib and erlotinib. Drug-related fatal AEs, almost completely identical between them. And the differences in any AEs was just 99.5 versus 97.5. This is not as much of a difference as many of us might have presumed there to be when they're actually tested side by side. I would say that it is possible that in EGFR mutation positive patients, they're more sensitive to both the toxicity and the efficacy. So we can't necessarily directly compare and presume this is exactly what we would see in EGFR mutation positive patients. But the, the direct comparative evidence we have only leads me to think there's a lot less of a difference than I might have presumed beforehand. What I would say is most important is to directly compare one EGFR TKI to another, and that trial's already been done. It's Lux Lung 7, it's an Asia and Europe trial, an ex-US trial of Jafitnib directly compared to a Fatnib in a little over 300 mutation positive patients. And the accrual was completed a couple of years ago, and we should expect to see the results uh, at next year's ASCO. Uh, the primary endpoint was PFS, but a uh, specified secondary endpoint of interest is overall survival. And I would say when we get these results, it should definitively answer the question for us because we won't have to just make inferences from cross-trial comparisons. But until, the trials, uh, until this trial result is presented, I think what we have is data showing a survival benefit that thus far has been unique to a fatinib, and that is not small, it's over a year. And we could just presume that we know what the results will be, but we have the, the best data that we have available uh, show us something that, that I think is difficult to ignore until we have more compelling evidence that there actually is equivalence between the two. Our presumptions may be correct or they may be incorrect, but if you're incorrect in that presumption, you've missed giving a therapy that does have a survival benefit that thus far has been shown to be at least uh, potentially unique and is more than a year's difference. So is there a gold standard? I, I would say it's still an, an open question, but that survival differences in, over, in uh, advanced lung cancer are hard to come by at all. And survival differences of more than a year are very hard to come by.
Uh, we had previously presumed that because of crossover that everyone would end up at the same place at, at the end of two, three years. But that's not what we're seeing. With the Japanese patients, 100% of them crossing over and still showing a survival difference, it's not just an issue of crossover. Other EGFR TKIs thus far have shown only a very weak trend, uh, even in deletion 19 patients, toward a better overall survival. So I don't think that we can really make the presumption until we get the results directly from Oxlung uh, 7 that all EGFR TKIs will confer the same benefit in uh, deletion 19 patients. And I think until we have evidence that does show their equivalent, it's incumbent on us to use the actual data that we have that show a survival benefit with afatinib in this particular subset. The subset matters for the first time in years, but I think we need to honor the data that we have. And in terms of toxicity, the direct comparative data that we have now uh, from Lux Lung 8 shows that the toxicity is less of a difference than uh, certainly I would have expected to see and that we should honor those data as well. Thanks very much. Happy to take questions when the time comes.